Well, it's good to be with you all this morning. For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Pastor John. I lead the Young Adults Ministry here at Canyon Hills. Uh, We called it college last summer and we expanded it uh, to be a little bit more uh, broad for young adults uh, and make it so that those who aren't in college, aren't going to college, or are already in the workforce, or everything in between, that they wouldn't feel excluded from the time. So I'm the young adults pastor. Been here for about a year with my lovely wife, Claire. We gave, uh, I didn't give birth, no, that was her. <laughs> she gave birth to our lovely son, Levi, uh, nine months ago. Nine months ago, like a couple days. And so uh, I'm a new dad. And wildly enough, he's been sleeping since he was three weeks old, like through the night. So I'm a new dad who's well rested, which is like finding a unicorn in space. Like it's, that's insane. But I wanted to start by saying something you probably wouldn't expect to hear on a Sunday morning from a pastor, which is that greed is good. That greed for money, greed for love, greed for power is good. That greed drives the upward progress of society and greed will save this country. Yeah, you're like, I definitely did not expect to hear that one. Well, that's because I didn't come up with that. That's a quote from a movie. And the movie's called Wall Street. And the actor Michael Douglas is actually portraying a character named Gordon Gecko. And he is obsessed, if you couldn't tell from that quote, he is obsessed with money. He can't get enough of it. And his mantra, greed is good, has become a cultural symbol for anyone who wants to become rich playing the stock market. Or for anyone who really just wants to pursue the wealth of the world. His words and his character, who he is, actually highlights something really, really important. And that's that we all worship something. We're all worshiping something. Gordon Gecko's character is worshiping money. He's worshiping power. He's worshiping love. His heart set, his actions, the things that he does are intentionally designed to glorify himself, glorify his finances, Glorify his power. Now, that's probably not the way that you expected me to start talking about a message on worship. But it's because we need to understand what worship is. Worship is any intentional activity done to bring glory to something or to someone. That's what worship is. That you exalt this thing or you exalt this person. And now that I've given you a a clear example of it, now that you've gotten to see it illustrated, now that you know the definition, I want to ask you the question, what did you walk in through those doors worshiping this morning? Because you might have thought coming into this that worship is just something you do for a few minutes at the beginning of a service. That you just sing it out a little bit, raise your hand maybe. That's not what worship is. That's what praise is. And praise is a part of worship. We'll get to that. But worship is what you intentionally do to glorify something. Some of you walked in here worshiping your relationship with your boyfriend or your girlfriend. That that is what you think about, that that is what matters to you, is that that is what you want to bring glory to. all. That's what you want all your friends to know about. That's what you talk about constantly. That's what you're known for. Some of you are worshiping your grades. You're worshiping getting to college. You're worshiping making money. You're worshiping family. You're worshiping anything right now. The question is, are you worshiping God? Because the way that you praise him in what we call corporate worship, the way that you praise him will reveal what you're worshiping. Worship is not just singing. Singing is a beautiful form of worship, and through this message, what I want to do is is break down why it is important for us to properly worship God and how singing praises to Him is one of the most powerful ways for us to set our hearts and our actions deliberately to glorify Him. That is not just something we do to check the box, but it is something we do to check our hearts. It is something we do to focus on Him. And put ourselves into a proper position of worship before him. 
So why do we sing if worship is anything that you do? Because it's, it's the way you live your life. Worship is the way you live your life. Do you live a life of worship? So what's the point of singing then? Singing is important to worship because it intentionally glorifies God through expressing our praise, our joy, and our sorrow. Three fundamental experiences of the human condition. And singing really kind of transcendently connects to those things. If you read poetry, if you sing music, if you look at a painting, there, there is art that connects deeply with the human soul and the human spirit. We are designed that way because our God is a God of creation. You look at Genesis and you see God creating constantly. Have you ever seen a giraffe? It doesn't make sense. Is it a horse? I don't know. I can't tell. But that neck is so long and it's so tall at the same time. And then you see a zebra and you're like, is that a horse? I can't tell. It's striped. Is it, is it white with black stripes, black with white? I don't know. You can't tell me that's not a God of creativity. He loves creating things. He's a God of beauty. Have you seen Mount Rainier the past couple days? Magnificent. My friends and I were out at Snohomish Valley Golf Center and we watched the sunset play over the Cascade Mountains and turn the mountains purple. It was crazy beautiful. And God created that moment. He's still creating. And we're made in his image. So there is a natural desire for us to express our creativity. And one of the most beautiful forms that we do that through is through singing. It's through music. And so it is natural that you would find in the word of God language that talks about praising him, rejoicing in him, expressing our sorrow through him, all with song. That the beauty in that creative singing process resonates specially with our soul and specially with our Lord. So hear this. Here's how it connects to praise. Psalm 147.1, how good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and how fitting to praise him. How good it is to sing. This psalm shows us so clearly that singing is a special form of connection to God. That again, it is not just something we do to do. It is something we do to connect to the heart of God. It is something that he takes seriously. Do you take it seriously? I don't know about you, but the things that God takes seriously, I want to take seriously. And he takes singing seriously. How pleasant and how fitting. When we recognize the magnificence of God, we cannot help but praise him. It allows us to express our joy. Psalm 511, but let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them. And those who love your name may exalt you. This psalm shows us the joy that we have in him. That despite what's going on, his protection allows us to feel joy even in hard circumstances. We just sang a song about that. It's not just words on a screen. It's words that resonate with our heart and the situation that we're in. When you think of all that he has done, do you rejoice that this God is your God? Do you take the time to enter worship like that to intentionally reflect on why you would be singing? Or do you just follow the melody? Or do you actually know why you're singing? Why you're rejoicing? And this is a proper response to the things that God has done, to be joyful for what he has done. The Hebrews did that when they, were ex when they were rescued out of Egypt. Literally, just as they got across the water, they turned around and they watched the entire Egyptian army drown to death. And the very hand that had oppressed them had been vanquished. And you know what their response was to that? They start singing. They start banging drums and they start going crazy. And the way they express their joy for what God has done is by singing to him. The apostles did this when they were in prison. They're shackled to a wall and they start singing. And their chains are literally broken. 
There is power in song. There is power in praise. There is power in joy. There is power in recognizing who our God is and responding accordingly. But fittingly, it also allows us to express our sorrow. Because God knows what it's like to be us. That's why he sent his son. His son walked among us, wept with us. Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Those words from Romans show us that singing and being together is a natural form of comfort and a natural form of outpouring our hearts. And those three things, where the Lord meets us with our praise, with our joy, and our sorrow, highlight a misconception that we tend to have about worshiping in church. The misconception is that church worship is about what I like and what I can do. About whether you like the way that it sounds or not. Whether you're a part of making the sounds happen. That that's all it is, that it's, it's about what you can get out of it. It's about whether you like the song, whether you like the lyrics, whether you like the melody. You're hearing a lot of you in that. Or about what you can produce, how well you can sing. Some of you don't sing when there's worship going on because you're like, I don't want to distract those around me from how bad my voice is. That's the excuse that I used for myself for years. When in reality, I was still worshiping myself because I was saying, I'm not going to give God praise because I don't like it. It's not about me. It doesn't matter how I sound, it's a matter who I'm praising. Don't, don't negate and steal glory from God by not singing. Just because you're self-conscious about the way that you look or the way that you sound or the way that you'll appear to other people. It's not about you. It's about God. It's about worshiping and praising Him and recognizing all that He has done for you already and all that He will continue to do because He can't stop being faithful. It's not about what you produce It's about what you lay down. Worship is about drawing nearer to God and nearer to one another. Those three verses that I read highlight that. The first two, our praise and our joy, clearly connected to how we experience God, to how we talk to him, to how he knows our hearts. And then the last one, when it says, do this together, shows us that worship And the expression of emotion happens best corporately, not individually. Worship and praising allows us to draw nearer to God and nearer to one another. Here's how it draws us nearer to God. I was talking to Chelsea Mason about this. She's one of our worship directors. You guys have seen her on Sunday. She said this, I was, I was asking about this, I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not on, the, on the worship team, I'm a, I'm a young adults pastor. I haven't been able to, this is a fun fact, I did uh, theater shows in Washington, D.C. I was a professional actor before I got into ministry. And I accidentally auditioned for a musical. Uh, I didn't know it was a musical, uh, even though it was a Christmas musical. Like it said musical on it, and I was like, it's not a musical. So I walked in, auditioned, they're like, do you have any music for us? And I was like, why would I have that? And they're like, because it's a musical. And I was like, no, it's not. It's a joke. So they're like, okay, can you just sing a Christmas song? And like all of them went out of my head. I mean, this was like August. How are you supposed to be thinking of Christmas songs in August? Like they probably would have kicked me out if I was thinking about Christmas songs. They're like, that's weird. That's weird that you're thinking about Christmas in August. But they're like, how about you just sing Happy Birthday? And I was like, can do. So I started singing Happy Birthday, and they're like, that was awful. That was terrible. And I'll tell you what, it's really hard being in like a, a room full of 60 people and three directors in front of you and everyone going like, you're trash. And I was like, oh. And they're like, can you match this note? So they play one note on the, like, on the piano. And for 10 minutes, I could not match a note. For, for real. They ended up, I did not get the part, (laughs) but they ended up firing the guy who did get the part and they called me back in and I ended up getting the job. Um, And that's when I, and I was like, man, y'all are out of luck. This is bad. They spent 
They spent two months. I had to work an extra hour and a half after rehearsals with a music director. And it took me two months to match my first note. Two months. My music, the music director started weeping when it happened. <laughs> she was like, this is all wasted effort. <laughs> so they had me lip sync and someone else sang off stage for me. And they just cut my mic. It was great. I highlight that to tell you how poorly I sing. Like, I can't sing. I don't know much about singing, so I had to ask Chelsea, what is all this stuff about singing? What is, what is the purpose of worship? She said this, we are innately designed for worship. On this side of eternity, we wrestle with the brokenness of worshiping the wrong thing. But ultimately, God's desire is for us to rightly worship him. The reality is one day all of creation will recognize who is actually worthy of worship. The question for us as believers is, will we take the Lord up on the opportunity to get a head start and give him the praise he is worthy of now? Or will we make excuses until eternity? I realized that I was making excuses because I felt like I couldn't sing. I knew I couldn't sing. That did not mean I couldn't worship. And I started worshiping. And Chelsea's words are so true because it allows us to experience a taste of eternity today. That for the rest of eternity, we are going to, in full unity, connection, and restoration with God, as we were made to be reconciled to him as his children, able to worship and praise him freely. And I realized that for years I'd been missing out on the opportunity to experience that. A literal taste of heaven on earth. That drew me nearer to God when I recognized that. That he would love me so much that he would want to encourage me by giving me the opportunity to worship him. To praise him. And I tell you what. It is so good to worship and to sing. I feel bad for those around me, but not about me, not about you. It's about singing to the Lord. Those first two verses, Psalm 147, Psalm 511, they allow us to draw near with confidence to God and sing to Him and praise Him and worship Him. Not just in the good times, but when it's difficult as well. Like the apostles, they were in prison. Not a good time. But their response was to draw near to God through worship. And look what he did in that. How many of you are chained to something right now? Some addiction, some relationship, you're worshiping a false idol? Have you thought about singing? Because it broke the chains of the apostles. And if he can do that with just a piece of metal, what do you think he can do with the thing the enemy's trying to chain you with? He can break that too. There is power in worship when we draw near to God from a proper heart. Scripture says in Hebrews, draw near with confidence, sing with confidence. It's not about how you sound, it's about who you're worshiping. It is not about how you feel about it, it's about how he feels about you. So praise him, worship him, draw near with confidence. And on that same note, when I said that we get a taste of eternity today, do you think that you'll be in eternity alone? No. Revelation says people from every tribe, tongue, and nation will be together. Everyone together. That is corporate worship. Look around this room right now. Are you alone? No, you are not. You have the opportunity to draw near to God together, which is again a taste of eternity today. Worship draws us nearer to one another. I love in Revelation 19, it says we will sing triumphantly together. That we will worship God with all joy together because there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more suffering, no more addiction, no more hurt, no more being let down or forgotten. And we'll get to sing 
knowing that it has all been made right and that our God was faithful and that he restored all things. And we won't be singing those songs alone because looking to our left and to our right in eternity, we'll be able to see witnesses to God's grace all around us. We're brought near together through unity, through singing. And that's a wonderful expression of unity, of bringing together a joyful noise. Again, I bring the noise to that part. But coming together and making the joyful noise to the Lord as one voice. Have you ever thought about that? That when you sing, that you are one voice. There is one sound. Unity brought through many. That is a picture of eternity, of what Christ has done is doing and will see completed. Worship is an expression of eternity, not an expression of your preferences. Listen to that again. Worship is an expression of eternity, not of your preference. It's about what God is bringing, not about what you think of yourself or what you think is good or bad. It's about what he has called holy. And it's about what he has called us all to, together. I heard this great thing when I was first starting out in ministry. Another pastor said to me, you know, you should, people should be about 75% happy with their worship experience. He said, and 25% of they should probably be like, ah, I don't really care for that. And he goes, that's good, that's fine. Because what's part of your 25% that you don't like is a part of someone else's in the room, 75% that they do like. And in that, you find unity together. When you might be in a specific moment where you're not quite feeling the song, you're not quite feeling the worship, look around you and find someone who is and worship with them because it's not about you. It's about you two together. It's about this room together. And they'll do the same thing because there's probably something that they don't like and they'll look over and see you worshiping and praising in full band and that will encourage them to worship. One of my favorite things is seeing David Newman play the piano. We do staff chapel and he was leading, he was playing the piano and I watched him as he was worshiping and that led me to a greater place of praise, of worship because I felt connection with my brother as we worshiped. Even though I was just like a face in the crowd. Just seeing his joy in worship brought me a deeper joy in worship. So look around when you worship. It's not about you. See the faces around you and worship with them. Worship together. Give glory to God together. I want to I ask you this question. Two questions. Who do you worship? And why do you not sing? Who do you worship? And why do you not sing? Do you worship yourself? If you worship yourself, you definitely won't sing because you'll be thinking that it's all about you. You worship something else? Do you sing about it in some other way by spending all your time and effort, money, resources, conversations about it? Or do you worship God? Who do you worship and why do you not sing the next time? And we're going to have an opportunity to respond here in a second. Because it would be silly to have a message about worship and then not give you the opportunity to apply what you just learned. When you stand in a second to sing, and if you're not singing, ask yourself a question, why? Why am I not singing? If it has anything to do with your thoughts about yourself, start singing. Because it's not about you. Or maybe you're not singing because you're, I, I don't know if I actually believe in who this God is who we're singing about. If you find yourself in that place, talk to one of the leaders because we would love for you to start singing. To know the power of this God who saves and is still saving. So when we stand to worship in a moment, think of who you actually worship and then respond accordingly.
Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you that we are in a place where we can freely worship without fear. We have no worries about how loud we are because we know that we won't be found out by some secret police or anything like that, Lord. There is no excuse for us to not sing with all of our heart. Would you help us sing praises to you? Would you meet us in our joy? Would you meet us in our sorrow? Would you meet us wherever we are? Would you give us the strength to sing and to praise your name? Not because of what we think of ourselves, but because of who you are and what you have shown us. Would you let us respond to your faithfulness to us, to your majesty, to your power, to how you are making all things good? Would you help us believe that this morning? Would you help us respond properly and worship you? as one body, giving us a taste of eternity. In Christ's name we pray, amen.